Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to be doing a retrospective on the crystal method. So before we begin, I just want to give everybody a big thank you for 200 subscribers. It really means a lot. Hopefully I can get to 300 very, very soon. So for those of you who don't know, the Crystal Method is an electronic music act formed in the early 90s by Scott Kirkland and Ken Jordan in Las Vegas, Nevada. These guys are pioneers of the big beat genre of electronic music. And their music has appeared in several movies, TV shows, and video games, so you're bound to have heard of them one way or another. The act remained a duo for over 20 years until Ken Jordan decided to leave, but more on that later. The Crystal Method has six studio albums under its belt, and a seventh one is on the way. So I'm gonna look at each album very briefly so that this doesn't become a never-ending video. And yeah, just my thoughts on each one, the tracks I like, the tracks I don't like. So yeah, let's begin. So let's start with Vegas, their debut album, an album that is almost 25 years old and almost as old as me, just one year younger. Many consider this to be their absolute best album to date. And I agree with that. Given how unique this album was at the time, nothing's ever gonna top this. It's a nice mix of big beat, trip hop, and 90s techno. These are among my absolute favorite electronic music genres and don't worry, one day I'll make a couple of videos on my history with electronic music. Big Beat is a genre that uses heavy breakbeats and synthesizer-generated loops and patterns. Trip Hop is a style of hip-hop that also relies on synthesizers. And when you think of techno, you think of pretty much whatever you heard in 90s rave clubs before artists like David Guetta, Afrojack, Calvin Harris, Deadmau5 and the late great Avicii came about in the 2000s and the 2010s. And even though Big Beat began its decline in 2001, it's electronic music like this that I was pretty much exposed to growing up until we got to the late 2000s, where EDM basically took over. Now unlike most Crystal Method fans, I'm one of those fans who discovered their songs in various media and then I got a hold of their albums. For example, my introduction to the Crystal Method was through the song Keep Hope Alive when it was used as the theme song for a TV show called Third Watch. Problem was, I didn't know who they were at the time. So when I got a hold of Vegas in 2018 and I listened to it, rediscovering Keep Hope Alive just gave me goosebumps. So as much as I enjoy pretty much every track on the album, my absolute fave is obviously going to be Keep Hope Alive for nostalgic reasons, and my least favorite, even though I still enjoy it, is Bad Stone. It's a slow trip-hop track that's actually pretty cool, but it's not quite as good as the rest of the tracks. Vegas is flawless, and if you're tired of modern electronic music, then this is a nice little detour. Besides, it's better than most of what's out there today. So I'm gonna give it a 10 out of 10. So Tweekend is the second album by The Crystal Method. And while it's another excellent outing by the duo, it doesn't completely match the heights of its predecessor. This album maintains pretty much the same style and tone of the first album, while also dabbling in a little bit of electronic rock, especially with tracks like Murder, You Know It's Hard. This album, of course, has the iconic single Name of the Game, which has been featured in numerous media, including feature films such as Blade 2. And while this album as a whole is great for the most part, the songs I don't like include PhD, Roll It Up, and Tough Guy. And they're quite possibly some of the Crystal Method's weakest tracks to date. To be more specific, my favorite track is Blowout, and my least favorite would probably be Tough Guy. And when compared to the rest of their discography, I don't think it's one of their absolute best albums, 
but it's still a very noteworthy effort and again, better than most electronic music these days. So I'm gonna give it a 9 out of 10. Next up is Legion of Boom, an album that I find to be extremely underrated in the duo's discography. It goes for pretty much everything they've done before, big beat, trip-hop, electronic rock, and there are even some elements of progressive trance music in here. You know, with the decline of big beat in the 2000s, these guys knew they were gonna have to keep things fresh, while also maintaining their identity. And when you think about it, this is the last old-school Crystal Method album. Because from their fourth album onwards, things change a bit. This album had one of the duo's most popular songs of all time, Born Too Slow, a track that many people recognize from the Need for Speed Underground soundtrack. The first one, not Underground 2. A song that featured guitar work from, believe it or not, one of Limp Bizkit's guitarists. For those of you who don't know, Limp Bizkit is a new metal band, and new metal was also a music genre that fizzled out over time. Rozelle, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, a rapper best known for his work with The Roots, contributed vocals and some impressive beatboxing on tracks like Starting Over, The American Way, and Ace Tone. I Know It's You, one of the earliest Crystal Method tracks I ever listened to, featured vocals, believe it or not, from Mila Jovovich. Yeah, Alice from Resident Evil. And the track Weapons of Mass Distortion did appear in Blade Trinity, though it was retitled Weapons of Mad Distortion, and it had vocals on it, unlike the original version. And here's a funny story. Before I discovered that two of their songs appeared in Blade films, specifically Name of the Game in Blade 2 and Weapons of Mad Distortion in Blade Trinity, I always assumed that the rave music at the beginning of the first film was also one of their tracks. I was wrong. Now admittedly, when I first heard this album, I didn't think it was all that amazing. I found it to be very repetitive and there were a couple songs that I found myself skipping from time to time. But after a while, the more I listened to this album, the more it grew on me. And now I think it's one of their strongest efforts to date. So yeah, I enjoy pretty much every single track on this album. My favorite would be Ace Tone. I think it's very underrated. My least favorite is The American Way, but still, I like that track. So for me personally, this is a 10 out of 10 album. So Divided by Night is the fourth album by The Crystal Method, and this one took a while to make. There's a six year gap between this album and Legion of Boom. And this is mainly because after the release of Legion of Boom, the duo decided to open up a new studio called Crystal Box. Setting it up and moving into it took up a lot of time, and the duo lost out on production time for Divided by Night. Plus, they had been attached to other projects, such as the soundtrack to a romantic drama film called London, and they even released a remix compilation called Drive, which was designed for workouts. When you think about it, all of their music is designed for workouts in a way. So with the decline of Big Beat, these guys knew they were gonna have to change things up for the next album. And that's precisely what they did. Gone are the traditional big beat elements, the instrumental trip hop, and even electronic rock. It went in a more mainstream direction with influences from EDM when it was still developing at the time. Their trip hop tracks included more guest features compared to previous albums, and there was an emphasis on live organic drum work as well as bass and distortion. Now some people didn't like the album because of this, in fact it got a very mixed response from critics and longtime fans. As for me, I liked it initially, I didn't love it, because I didn't like the idea of these guys abandoning their roots and just giving in to the mainstream, but 
Upon revisiting it, it grew on me and I think it's very underrated. It was a nice change of pace. You know, there's nothing wrong with artists trying out new things, just as long as they don't completely betray who they are. I mean, sure, there's a lot of new ideas on this album, but they all felt like they could only be executed by one duo, The Crystal Method. And besides, if you're listening to their discography and their old school big beat roots are getting tiresome, then I can guarantee you'll find this album to be surprising. There's even a couple of interesting guest features on this album, such as the Jewish singer Marty Shahu on Drown in the Now. A track so awesome and underrated that it sounded like something I'd listen to while playing, I don't know, Watch Dogs 2? And I don't think it was in there if I recall. It should have been. And of course, LMFAO, who we all know for the party rock anthem, on Sign Language. A track that I do enjoy, even if the lyrics are a little bit cringy. The only gripe I have with the album is that the last four tracks aren't anything special. I know the single Black Rainbows is among them, but yeah, compared to everything else, those four tracks don't really stand out to me. My favorite track is Come Back Clean, and my least favorite track is probably Falling Hard. I mean, I don't even remember that song, to be honest. So overall, I really, really, really enjoyed this album, and I think it's their best work since Legion of Boom, and I'm gonna give it a 9 out of 10. So now we're looking at their fifth album, the self-titled The Crystal Method. This album has an interesting history behind it, mainly due to the fact that it was being recorded throughout 2013 when EDM and dubstep were kind of at their peak at the time. And about halfway through production, Scott Kirkland had to take a break in order to get brain surgery done. The surgery was successful, and according to him, in some ways, the surgery made the recording of the album even better. Plus, this is also the last album to feature Scott Kirkland and Ken Jordan working together. Ken Jordan decided to retire from music about three years after the album's release, leaving Scott to handle the Crystal Method moniker on his own. So this album takes a lot of influences from, as I mentioned earlier, EDM and dubstep. And I guess it's because of that that I consider it to be my least favorite album. I still really enjoy it, but it's just not up there with everything else they've done. Now admittedly, had I listened to this album at the time of its release, it probably would have been one of my all-time favorites, mainly because at that time I was in high school and I was a huge, huge fan of EDM like everybody else was. But even that EDM and even other subgenres like dubstep have all fizzled out and I don't even know what they call electronic music now and I don't even care. I don't really like it. I don't give a shit. You know, I'd rather listen to 10 hours of grindcore from a band like Cattle Decapitation than listen to what's out there now. So in some ways, there is a nostalgic flair to this album for me, but I still think it somewhat pales in comparison to the duo's best efforts. And again, it's nice to see them trying out new things, but this is the album that feels the least like a Crystal Method album. So what I will say up front is that I do appreciate these guys putting their own spin on the genre. I mean, the first couple of tracks should be a clear indication of that, especially on the single Over It, which is a very unique hybrid of dubstep and breakbeat, in my opinion. 1110 to the 101 felt like a fresh take on trip hop, and even Dozy Meter had a nice little tempo change in it. Difference, featuring Frankie Perez, is also an interesting take on dubstep. And the Metro interlude, that was also pretty cool. This is also one of their heaviest sounding albums to date. So if you like a little bit of aggression in your dance music, then well, there you go. But here are my problems with this album. It's occasionally repetitive and there are some tracks that just follow the typical EDM formula of that time and yeah, they feel a bit uninspired, they don't really go anywhere. But most of the album is still pretty enjoyable. It's just that this doesn't feel like a Crystal Method album at times. My favorite track is 1110 to the 101 and my least favorite track is probably After Hours. 
This is still a solid album though. Whether you like the Crystal Method, whether you like EDM, it's still enjoyable and I'll give it an 8 out of 10. So the trip home is the sixth album by The Crystal Method, and the first with Scott Kirkland as a solo artist under the name. He was obviously under a lot of pressure with this album, because it would be the first one produced entirely by himself, and he had to figure out what kind of direction to take The Crystal Method's signature sound into going forward. So his idea of doing this was to take that signature sound, and without falling into the tropes and trappings of the mainstream, reinvigorate it and reintroduce it to a new audience. That way it could feel fresh for longtime fans as well as casual listeners. There's trip hop, breakbeat, some elements of EDM but not too many, as well as some ambient stuff in here that I think a lot of people will like. But did this album as a whole work for me? Yes, I actually think it's a step up from the last one. I don't think it's one of their absolute best efforts for now, I mean it might grow on me in the future, but regardless, I still really enjoyed it. I mean from the opening track, The Rays, you can tell that you're in for something special. And it even has a nice little throwback to Trip Like I Do, which is the opening track on the very first album, Vegas. Holy Op and Turbulence are great trip hop tracks. Ghost in the City is one of the more mainstream radio friendly tracks on the album. And it's still better than most of what you hear on the radio when it comes to EDM. Carry On is a nice little ambient interlude. And there's even a reworking of Difference from the previous album. Here it's titled There's a Difference. It still features Frankie Perez's vocals, but it's a bit more of a retro ambience track than a dubstep track. And yeah, it's such a cool way for Scott Kirkland to continue the Crystal Method legacy, given how long he and Ken Jordan were in the industry for. Now I will admit up front, the second half of the album just isn't as solid as the first half. It's just not as memorable. There's some good tracks in there, like There's a Difference and Hold On To Something, but still, the others just aren't as great as the rest. My favorite track is Moment Of Truth, and my least favorite track is chapter one. But overall, this is still a solid album that will probably grow on me, as I mentioned earlier, with a couple more listens. So I'm gonna give it a nine out of 10. So yeah, that was my retrospective on The Crystal Method. I'm really looking forward to what's coming in the next album, The Trip Out. Apparently it's scheduled for April instead of February. So next time we're going to be looking at the new Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie that just premiered on Netflix. So thank you all for watching, please be sure to like the video, share it and subscribe, hit the notification icon, be safe during this time and I'll see you soon.